So welcome back to World War II TV, folks, and Battles at Sea Week. And I hope you saw the show with John McKay yesterday about surviving the Arctic convoys, all about his veteran friend Charlie, because it was very emotional at times and talking about the recognition of the veterans and a really, really good show. But tonight we're going more to the actual um, operations, the, 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 the technical side of things. And my guest tonight is an absolute YouTube legend within the sphere of naval history and engineering. So Drac from the incredible Drac NFL YouTube channel. So um, good evening, Drac. How are you doing? Hello, I'm doing quite well, thank you. It's uh, stopped raining, believe it or not. Oh, it was really warm days. here in Normandy today. I was actually not in, in Caen today getting my paperwork to stay here post Brexit, my car <laughs> to stage or so I'm now I'm okay now. I'm good. I can stay here for 10 years now. So I'm happy. So it's really hot. But right, so Arctic convoys. So mm. um, you know, we talked about the the human impact yesterday. And on Monday, when Brian Walter was on, we were talking about the Battle of the Atlantic, which overlaps with the Arctic convoys, but um, it's something you have talked about a lot on your channel, and the, the PQ-17 is the big one that is the one that talks about, and it has very far-reaching effects beyond just the, the loss of the convoy, which we'll go into in, in the show, of course. It's, it affects mm -hmm. Anglo-US relations, Anglo-US-Soviet relations. It, 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 it challenges, in a sense, naval policy completely. So is it something you were interested in for, been interested in for a long time is it built up what, what what's your interest in it where does it stem from it's well i mean it's obviously it's part of naval history generally but it's also one of those things that you know it's a very commonly discussed element of world war ii at least in the uk i suppose it probably not got so much traction in somewhere like the states but if you if you think about it if someone says oh what happened at world when world war ii at sea most people who have got passing interest will probably talk to you about Hood um, and Bismarck, and they might talk to a bit about Pearl Harbor. And in the UK, they'll usually also mention PQ-17 in the context of the convoys, which is rather interesting considering, you know, the Battle of the Atlantic is where most of the convoys are. But there's no single convoy battle in the Atlantic that has quite caught on in the public imagination the way that PQ-17 did. Yeah, and I mean, just in my prep for it, you can you can pull up some really interesting quotes because ri ridiculously, the American actor Douglas Fairbanks Jr. was in one of the ships, so he said something about it. Churchill, of course, wrote about it later. Ernest King, the American admiral, said so. It, lots of quite big people said things about it, so it, it became so. When you get an event that has sound bites produced from it, that creates some sort of energy that makes it. You can you can discuss it seven, you know, seventy mm. uh, nine, eighty years later, whatever it is. 89 years, 79 years later, that's right. I'll get my math right in the end. So um, it is, it is, it's, it's gone beyond itself now to become something that represents, in a sense, a British way of doing things. The Americans got disappointed with things. We'll go into it later on. But yeah. so to, for the basics, for people who didn't show, see yesterday's show, or, mm -hmm. or what, what, what were the Arctic convoys all about? Why were they set up? What was the main purpose behind them? So the, the, the Arctic convoys have a, dual role there's kind of the practical and the political the political aspect is effectively we've got to show as the western allies that we're supporting the soviet union in its struggle with the germans and there isn't there's no way in 1942 that there's going to be a second front opened in europe which would obviously like to happen with the d-day landings and so the only way to, other way to do that is to supply the russians with equipment and munitions and raw materials and pretty much everything else you need for um, to make war. And this is where the sort of the practical element comes in because the Russians are in the process of taking some absolutely horrific losses uh, due to the German invasion, not just in men, but a lot of their material, tanks, aircraft, etc., are all either being destroyed or captured in very large numbers. They're not a completely mechanized army. Now, fair enough, the Germans aren't either, but mechanization of your transport does help with your logistics, which is very important, especially in a country the size of Russia. And on top of all of that, there is a level of supply disruption because not only are various resource extraction areas falling under German control, but although the Russians are rescuing many of their factories, they're having to almost physically pick up the entire factory and ship it over to the Ural Mountains, which takes time. So there's the the time they need to actually take apart 
the factories, ship them across and rebuild them, during which time the factories aren't producing anything. And there's the knock-on effects of, okay, well, we used to send steel or coal or whatever to this factory, and now we have to send it a thousand miles in the other direction over logistics networks that perhaps don't exist or are very poor or were never designed to handle this amount of traffic. So whilst the Russians, whilst it plays somewhat into the trope of endless Russian hordes, which is not accurate, but no. the Russians, if they have surplus of anything at this point, it's men, um, but they don't have as many tanks, as many guns, as many aircraft and as much material and ammunition to produce and and supply them as they need or as they'd like and that's mainly what these convoys are there to supply it's essentially allowing them a bit of catch-up time isn't it it's it's to, yeah they, they, they are mechanizing themselves they are producing trucks they are producing weaponry but this is just a bit of a breathing space to allow them to to to, to chill a little bit in the you know they've got Leningrad going on, they've got mm. Barbarossa going on. It's it's all hands on the pump, and this is just helping out. But it's also there's a big propaganda element. I mean, even again, you go on YouTube today. There's lots of Pathé films from from forty two and forty three. There was clearly a PR exercise behind this, and they they they, they stage these convoys leaving and Brits meeting Russians and furry hats and Royal Navy ratings. And there's an element of, of showing the world. And I guess showing the Germans that there's the cooperation between these, na these, these, these nations that the Germans know that the Soviets and the British and the Americans aren't really, really friends. They know that it's, it's only to mean, meet an end of, 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 of removing the Nazis. So this is part of this message to the, the third right. Actually, we're, we are quite chummy. We are we are helping each other. We are together mm. in this, which is something the Germans aren't presenting that very well with their own relationship with the Japanese and Italians, which is so it's, it's a rabbit hole that, but it's a fraught relationship if there even is one between the Germans and the Japanese. They're kind of operating mm. with the same goal, but completely independently. So there's there's lots of messages going on with this. But when we talked with John McKay yesterday, we were talking about PQ eighteen, the one that followed mm. the one we're talking about tonight, which was getting towards the winter of September for you. This is, uh, you know, we talked about yesterday about there's kind of essentially two routes to get supplies to Russia, the summer route and the winter route. And it's all about the avoiding in the winter, the, the ice. And then and the whole purpose of the route is about avoiding as best you can German Luftwaffe interaction and, uh, and, um, and surface and U boat. So Wolfbacks. And so or avoiding all those hazards so yeah. PQ seventeen, where does it? How long have we been doing convoys before PQ seventeen, and had had they been more or less successful up to this point? So the convoys have been operating, well, as the name might suggest, there's been sixteen previous convoys in the PQ series, and this is one of the things with um, the various convoys that run in World War Two, not just the Arctic ones. Each convoy series has a letter designation, two letter designation, and then that's switched around for the return journey. So PQ is going to Russia, QP convoys are coming back from Russia, and then you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the, these convoys have been running for, for a, quite a while at this point. Um, they've started up shortly after the uh, German invasion of Russia. And in, in terms of success, the early ones had been quite successful, largely because the Germans hadn't actually thought that the Allies were going to do this. And so they didn't have tremendous numbers of anti-shipping aircraft and U-boats, etc., all committed to the northern Norway region. But as time had gone on, um, spring turns into summer of 1942, the, the Germans are allocating more and more resources to hit these convoys and as a result losses are increasing even though allied escort strength with the u.s getting more and more involved obviously as 42 goes on even though the allied escort strength is increasing losses are going up as well and from the map you can you can see this is one of the reasons why they're running convoys in the middle of summer because one of the issues that will come up with uh to later is the fact that at this point sort of june july there's basically no darkness, which is rather important because aircraft, generally speaking, can't operate at night um, in a strike roll during this time period. So the hours of darkness are vital in most cases for shielding you from the attentions of things like the Luftwaffe. 
you don't have that during the summer, but what you do have, as shown, is you can go a lot further north because the ice isn't there as much, which in turn means that you're less likely to be attacked in the first place. Yeah. So, and also, we should remind people that 42 is kind of coinciding with the Germans' peak period uh, in the Atlantic and in the Arctic. It's that it's going to get worse for them, as Brian Walter explained on Monday, as the war goes on, and the Allies are going to get more and more power and more and more resources. But this is coinciding with their kind of um, peak peak era here. So, but, but let's come to the the PQ seventeen. So you're saying it's mm -hmm. it's now set for summer. So we're talking July, well, forming up end of June for July 40, 42. Yeah. Um, and so they're going the summer route. Um, but it's a big convoy, and it, there there had been. Am I correct in saying there had been issues with PQ fifteen and PQ sixteen? They had been they had they had some 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 attacks, and uh, there was there was suggestion that things were bubbling and building in that area there. Yes, so that they, they, as I said, during the the latter PQ convoys, there had been this upsurge in German attacks, and also from what the Allies could tell via reconnaissance in Norway, there was a much larger build up of German forces waiting for the next convoy, and this will play into a lot what happens with PQ seventeen, because although there have been various German Kriegsmarine heavy units committed to Norway already. You've got additional Kriegsmarine heavy units, heavy cruisers, battleships, etc., all being moved in. And once they're there, they're also being moved further north. So instead of being positioned to perhaps threaten to break out into the Atlantic, they're positioning themselves much, much closer to these Arctic convoy routes, which is a rather unsubtle way of pointing out to the Allies when but once the recon comes in that actually yes we are planning on hitting you with some fairly heavy ships fairly soon and that gets everybody very worried so at this point i mean i'm kind of considering in that like an arnhem discussion hmm. is there any is there any discussions about whether or not this is this is in, this is necessary. If 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 we're thinking the Allies are thinking there's definitely an increased risk now, mm -hmm. we've got an idea there's a larger force out a force out there than there has been earlier. Um, th does it have to go ahead? Is there any um, reasonable argument to suggest it shouldn't have shouldn't have occurred or should have been delayed? So there's there, again, it comes down to a bit of political and practical. Politically, to just say actually, we're a bit too scared of the Germans, we're not doing convoys anymore, would have been politically disastrous yeah. for the, um, with the Western ally-Soviet relationship. If they're going to suspend them at all, it's basically going to have to be because it's provable that everything's gone to pieces, which unfortunately is going to mean the destruction of most of a convoy. Um, but the, the practical part of it is that, you know, it's mid-1942, the Soviets aren't doing particularly brilliantly, um, and they need every scrap of, of supplies that they can get to the point that, um, even though there's obviously, again, a fairly large country, some of the ships that are formed up for PQ-17 are carrying even basic stuff like food and food components like flour. And now, of course, you're not going to supply the entire Russian population with a couple of ships full of full of foodstuffs and to be and most of them are full of military stores of various descriptions but the fact that they're even bothering to try that shows how desperate the russians were getting or at least how desperate the russians were saying that they were getting to everybody else which may or may not be a slightly different thing because of course whilst they are allies there is a little bit of brinksmanship still going on uh, between the yeah. two sides I mean, David O'Keefe, the Canadian historian, is saying, of course, it's it's politically is is, is more important in allied Soviet ally relations than even the Second Front. It was the gesture, and also vital to Soviet industry as well. I think that's a very valid point there. So yeah. you said you said it was carrying foodstuffs and military equipment. So run us down, you know, what, how many vessels are we talking about transporting stuff, and what was kind of the percentage of different types of stuff taken on this on PQ seventeen? So you've got just under three dozen actual merchant ships um you've got uh the escorts as well and then and in between the escorts and the actual cargo carrying merchant ships you've got some auxiliaries and the auxiliaries this is displaying some lessons learned already from the battle of the atlantic it includes things like rescue ships 
which are specifically tasked and equipped to handle survivors of other ships that get sunk, uh, as, and as well as the whole range of small escorts from anti-aircraft ships to minesweepers to trawlers to destroyers, etc. And that's just in the close-in groups. Um, it, most of what they're carrying is generic military stores, explosives, high-quality fuel, um, ammunition. So as I say, you've got components of, of all the way up to finished parts. So you've got explosives for the Russians to turn into what they want. Yeah. You've got ammunition um, for some of the vehicles and tanks that they're bringing because they're rather specific. And then you have things like tanks, vehicles, aircraft, and so on. And much, much as Dave O'Keefe in the comments was saying, to be perfectly fair, although the tanks and the aircraft are fairly useful to the Russians, because, hey, free, free vehicles to fight with, in the grand scheme of things, your the more important things are machine tools, machine parts, stuff to allow them to build more things, um, raw materials to turn into stuff that you know is common to what they've already got, and perhaps most critically beyond the, the machinery elements and the supplies for that is specific stuff such as trains and trucks. Now, you might think, oh, well, why is that important compared to a tank? Well, the thing is, you, you only need a limited number of trains. Okay, trains are getting bombed, trucks are getting bombed, supply lines are getting attacked, but the losses in those areas are significantly lower than the horrific attrition that's going on on the front line with tanks. Mm. But e either of those, whether it be a truck or a steam engine, requires quite a substantial factory or series of factories to produce. And the Russians are in the process of turning practically any factory they've got that could produce any kind of motorized vehicle into a war machine factory, mostly for tanks and aircraft. And so if the Allies can supply pre-made tanks, pre-made trucks, that means there are fewer factories that the Soviets are having to use to produce those things. And that means there are more Soviet factories that can be used to turn out T-34s and KV-1s and, and eventually IS-1s and such. And the Soviet factories, obviously, with access to both the resources that are being brought in and the resources that are already there in the USSR, can turn out tanks far, far, far quicker than you can ever supply mm. by convoy. So it's actually, as I say, while, whilst the finished product's quite nice to have at the time, the long-term military effect of a ship full of steam trains is actually going to be far more significant than that same ship if it was full of Sherman tanks. I'm kind of reminded of them that, yeah, the, the, you know, give a man a, f a fish and he feeds himself, give a man a fishing rod. And he, I'm kind of reminded of that yeah. kind of parable there in the sense that it's not just sending loads of cans of bully beef and, and gunpowder, metaphorically. It's, it's sending mm. uh, a, a package that they can insert into their entire infrastructure as david o'keefe is saying there to kind mm. of boost them all up it's like a yeah like an aid package sent by united nations to a country in relief these days it's all very well thought out to have all those components in it that will give them this breathing space give them a chance to build up their mechanization build up their industry build up their armaments and and fight back the germans i i wanted to get that across to the viewers that it's it's not just, hey, let's send them some stuff. This is very well thought out at a high level. So, hmm. and in terms of talking of being well thought out at a high level, mid 42, the Allies, we're kind of getting better at convoys than we had been earlier. It's, we're, we're maybe not as good as we will get, but we're the, because we'll bring on to asking about hmm. the escorts now. We're, we're certainly not at our worst now. We're, we're, we're showing improvements. So, you know, we're, as you said, with support vessels and rescue vessels, we, we've we've learned from our mistakes a little bit. Uh, we've got the Canadian involvement now. We've got American involvement now. So it's not quite sending any old boat will do as we had been two years early on things. Mm. So the the escorts that are sent in to 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 because you know we've just established this is a very important convoy with very very important materials to give uh, Russia or Soviet Union a kickstart. So. Therefore, it's going to get the associated protection. So what was the escort force? So the escort force is divided ostensibly into two, but more realistically into three. So you've got the what's classed as the convoy escort itself, which is made up of uh, anti-submarine trawlers, minesweepers, a variety of destroyers of a bewildering number of classes and sizes. Um, 
some corvettes, which are obviously better to, for, again, used to support the trawlers for anti-submarine warfare. There's a couple of submarines po poking along as well, just um, because. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're somewhat useful. And that those all of those are collectively put together in what's called the close escort. So these are the ships that are actually sailing with the merchant ships. Then as part of still the covering force for the convoy itself, you have a cruiser squadron, which is made up primarily of heavy cruisers with a couple of destroyers there for anti-submarine work and anti-aircraft fire support. And they're close to the convoy, but they're not directly with it. So you rarely will see, although well, you will occasionally see, but rarely you'll see photos of cruisers that are sailing on the Arctic convoy route with merchant ships in the back background. Then you have the separate force, which is the distant force, and that's a very heavy strike group, and that's made up of some more cruisers, a couple of battleships, one British, one American, one aircraft carrier, the Victorious, and a whole load of destroyers, obviously, again, serving as escort. And they are completely separate. They're quite a distance away from the convoy for most of the time. And effectively, the idea is that the close-in group, the minesweepers, corvettes, and destroyers, they'll keep the convoy safe from anti-air attack. They'll keep the convoy safe from submarines. The cruiser force that's covering them is supposed to see off the kind of generic surface radar elements uh, if if they come out, which occasionally small German surface raiding forces had been known to, to pop out of their harbours. And then the distant force is there only really to cover the eventuality of something really big and scary come out. Because to be honest, if the Germans send out even anything up to a Deutschland class cruiser, yes, it's got six 11 inch guns, but you know, four heavy cruisers can quite easily take it to task. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's only if the Germans sail with everything they've got, including Tirpitz and or Scharnhorst that the heavy group needs to come in and that's when the battleships need to bring their big guns into play. Now, I'm I'm listening to this as a ground forces guy, and I'm mm. thinking and David O'Keefe is watching, who is of course Mr. Diet, Mr. Pinch Raid, and mm. in his book on Diet, they're talking about the on, on that raid in August, which is only a month after this, in in effect, the, the difficulty of exactly who's in charge of which element mm. and coordination and communication and Ha the, when the just for the those who have no idea at all watching this, who the hell is in charge of this convoy? They've got, have they got some sort of pre-planned strategies to deal with certain eventualities, and then there's a certain amount of stuff they will have to improvise depending on what happens on the day. But who makes those calls? How do they communicate it to the other people in the fleet? And how does that communication work? Because obviously we're talking about elements of radio science and things like that. So it seems to me a lot of moving parts um, and everybody must surely within this convoy know their part in it and what their role is. And that's so interesting talking to John yesterday about Charlie, mm. you know, a leading seaman on, on a 4.7 gun on, on, on a ship in his convoy. He, he has no idea about what's going on at a higher level, who's in charge of moving them but someone has to know all that so who knows that and how is that how is that planning carried out and how do the people on this fleet know what's going on and what right. to do so, when the shit hits the fan so so the allies have four commanders um there's commodore john dowding and he is the convoy commodore so he has to cat herd the the various ship the merchant ships um you've then got uh captain temporarily uh temporarily technically speaking commodore broom who is in charge of the convoy close escort i.e., the military element of the convoy then you've got um admiral hamilton rear admiral hamilton he's in charge of the cruiser group and then finally you've got admiral tovey as commander-in-chief of the home fleet who's sailing with the heavy ships in the in the distant force they are all supposed to work together um, each of them has their own areas of responsibility, as we've already outlined. Yep. But ultimately, they are also, as it will turn out, somewhat fatally dependent on signals coming in from the Admiralty as well, who are the, the Admiralty are the ones who are in receipt of the most recent recon information, the most recent intel, signal intercepts and such. And they're the ones who then relay the information and any necessary orders as they see fit out to all four of these um, officers who will then take, hopefully take the appropriate actions in the various um, elements of their, the convoy that they're in charge of. 
So the, 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 the Admiralty is in, heavily involved in this. And as you said, mm -hmm. their naval intelligence signals, ultra, all those things that are that, that the aces up our sleeves, that's the information supposedly we're getting. And, and I guess weather information, well, because they're mm. getting weather from the, from across the Atlantic and it's all going to help him because... So, so they're, they're armed with a, a plan of what to do. So let's talk about... Um, the convoy set. Well, well, when did it? When did it? When did it? Where did it depart from? When did it go? And it started off fairly well. And when did it run into problems? Right. So the, the the one thing to bear in mind here is that there is an element, a distinct element of nervousness going into this particular convoy because it's the first time significant elements of the U.S. Navy have been deployed as part of uh, the Atl the Arctic convoy operations. So everyone's running a little bit nervous you know kind of what you want to put your best foot forward but also if things are going to go wrong and bear in mind what we said earlier about the fact that germans have been escalating their attacks this would be the worst convoy thing for things to go wrong on especially if a bunch of valuable and brand sort of new to the war u.s navy ships end up on the bottom as a result um and now obviously because the germans are escalating the risk of that is much higher but so the on paper how it would look to everybody else if the US shows up and the first thing that happens is far more casualties than any other previous convoy. You know, Anglo-American relations are a lot stronger than the Western ally Soviet relations, but um, Admiral King is not the world's biggest fan of the British in general. No. So, um, and and they, the British are pretty pretty aware of that, to be perfectly honest. So you know, there's there's a lot of pressure on this one. There's there's mm. there's, there's the pressure of the increased threat from the Germans. There's a pressure of showing the new the new team uh, how we're doing it. And obviously, the American mm. uh, involvement they're playing by the British the the, the Commonwealth rules. So they yeah. they they haven't got any any role to influence how it's being run. So we want to put on a good show for them. The Soviets, as we're dealing with, they're dealing with lots of things going on for them in the middle of '42. So they're in they're they're kind of desperate for everything. Um, so you know the the stage is set. You know, this, if this mm. is a movie script, you kind of know that the middle act is going to have Defense, some yes. kind of peril coming. So it starts off. So so yeah, it's. Um, yeah. I'll hand over to you to explain a bit more about the the actual um, the departure, basically. Yeah. The so so the convoy forms up in Iceland, uh, believe it or not, because that's the best i mean a lot of these ships are coming from all over the place so it's best it's best to start off in iceland it gives them the best shot for the summer route rather than if you end up running up from the uk's ports a there's a lot more coastal submarines um german coastal submarines operating in round uk waters and as you can see from the map it also if you start off from the uk you you would end up effectively sailing the the leg of the winter route for the, an early yeah. part which puts you makes you more vulnerable so everybody's headed off to iceland formed up and headed out um as they head further east there are stages which are predetermined by the admiralty at least in theory as to where each element of the convoy escort can go because one of the things that they're generally nervous about regardless of whether or not there's a u.s presence is that the closer and closer you get to norway the more and more you've got to deal with the Luftwaffe, the more and more you've got to deal with submarines, and and those are the things that could kill really valuable heavy ships without a German surface radar ever having to show up. So the heavy covering force, the battleships and the carriers, paradoxically, despite the fact that the biggest, nastiest units out there are, at the, at the start of the convoy, supposed to turn back first because they're the most valuable and to be honest, when you're sailing in really high Arctic waters, there's not a tremendous amount they can do anyway. Um, then the cruisers will continue a bit further, but then turn back again because cruisers are valuable, not quite as valuable as the capital ships, but still. And that will leave the close escort protection as basically the ships that will run the convoy that last leg into Archangelisk. Um as it turns out, as they're mo motoring along, the convoy does come under some attack. Um, they do take some losses, but it's not going too badly. I mean, by this point, the Allies, especially the British, they've had experience in the Atlantic. They've had experience in the Mediterranean trying to supply Malta. So out of 35 merchant ships, the fact that they've lost three or four is that this is a good day for them at this Acceptable. point. Yeah. 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 Um, 
the Admiralty starts to get a little bit nervous because there's indications that Tirpitz might be on the move. Then you have these um, the the sort of the cut cutoff points where everybody's supposed to turn back at various points. They start getting adjusted by the Admiralty initially drifting further east, um, but then it starts to look at it starts to look more and more at least to Admiralty intelligence like Tirpitz and or other German heavy units may be somewhere at sea. And this is where it starts to all go a little bit wrong because there's uh, there's a bunch of confusion that because Tirpitz was originally based further south than the rest of the German units. The Germans authorized Tirpitz to move forward to base with everybody else. That meant Tirpitz left its original anchorage. So they now know Tirpitz is at sea, but is it coming straight for the convoy? Is it going just going to meet up with its mates? No one knows. Um, and obviously they know this is Tirpitz cruising speed. At the speed it's going, it could reach the convoy at time X. So the closer and closer they get to time X, the more and more nervous everybody is getting. The intel isn't coming back yet to tell them what's going on at Altenfjord, where where the rest of the German fleet is. Is Tirpitz there? Is it not there? Has anyone else left Altenfjord? We don't know. And ultimately, everybody gets a little bit too scared, and they start sending out signals telling the heavier units to turn back, the cruisers and the battleships. And then they send out this series of messages ordering the convoy to disperse. And the confusion part comes in not just because of Tirpitz, but because they also know, they do know from Signals Intel that the U-boats have sailed. There's a force of U-boats heading to intercept the convoy. And, you know, battleships can't fight U-boats. U-boats can sink battleships. Yeah. So the order to get for the heavy force to turn back is because of the U-boat threat. But they don't tell the, the battleships that this is why they're telling them to turn back. They just tell them you need to turn back because of the enemy. And then subsequent to that, very shortly thereafter, you get this series of signals to the convoy telling it to disperse because of the specifically because of the threat of German surface units. And the commanders on the scene, they try and put two and two together and they think, okay, well, we know the, the convoy itself is being told to disperse because of the German surface units. No one said specifically why the rest of us are supposed to turn back, but therefore it must be because of the threat of German surface units. It's not, but they don't know that because the Admiralty is not being clear. And then what really doesn't help is shortly after sending the signal to disperse, which is kind of a, a more mild signal, yeah. they then send another signal that says the convoy is to scatter. And that really doesn't help because effectively it's telling them to do the same thing, um, just with a little bit more urgency. But specifically saying convoy is to scatter in the some of the sort of the pre-written orders is noted to be effectively, we think the German heavy units are about to be right on top of you, basically skedaddle in all directions so they can't get you all. And there's some indication that actually all that signal was meant to be was the first signal was meant to say scatter. But if you're looking at it again from the convoy commander's perspective, they've been they've received this barrage of signals, first an indeterminate one telling their heavy units to pull back, then an, another one saying that you need to disperse, and then almost immediately on top of that, a more urgent one saying you need to scatter. So from the, for their perspective, it sounds like the Admiralty is panicking and basically trying to tell them without broadcasting in a way that the Germans can notice, watch out, Tirpitz is about to come over the horizon. So everybody's... Um, goes, oh, okay, I guess this is happening now, and the convoy starts scattering to the four winds. That turns out to be something of a mistake, because, of course, hilariously enough, at the time the signal is sent, Tirpitz is snuggled up in Altenfjord, yeah, it's not, <laughs> doing yeah, nothing. I mean, but I think there's a couple of things we want to, I want to go back with regards mm. to Tirpitz. And firstly, yeah. uh, David O'Keefe, who is Mr. Pinch, Mr. Enigma, Mr. Ultra, confirming that Harry Hinsey at Bletchley, Tirpitz mm. had gone over to the four rotor Enigma, so the, the, a lot of what it was doing then, we just don't know about. The, mm -hmm. the ace we'd had of reading traffic, we've lost it because we've, they've gone from three rotor enigmas to four rotor. So mm. that, but I also, I, I think it's it's difficult. People like yourself, who incredibly versed on naval history, if you imagine that the Admiralty or any of those Royal Naval establishments 
you can, when the turpits comes up in the in the room, everybody kind of has that hush silence. We, we, whether or not the turpits deserved that kind of reputation is neither here nor there. It did. Mm. It had this. It was the bogeyman. It was the. It was the. It was the the elephant in the room. That as soon as the turpits came in, everyone's stress levels kind of go up without anybody saying anything. And that's definitely a factor, isn't it? It's just a human mm. reaction. All those staff, all those people filing things in cabinets and moving things on board. They're all a little bit tenser as soon as the word turpits comes into this yeah. situation. And then with the not the not the complete knowledge of knowing where the turpits is, you can start to see some of this this reaction just being the ante is up suddenly. Uh, I, yeah. I know we're talking about a highly organized convoy. We're talking about all these supplies being worked out, but now human reactions come in. That's the that's the thing you can't really you can't quantify and plan for that. You can't you can't allow for the fact everyone's a little bit more on edge. So do, do you think that if it hadn't been the Tirpitz, things that, I mean, okay, that, that that's obviously a stupid question, mm -hmm. but things would have gone very differently, but the Tirpitz, that psychological effect is significant, isn't it? I, I think either Tirpitz or Sean Horst would have had Sean a similar Horst, yeah. effect. Um, and it, it basically comes down to the fact that the distant covering force is, is not and cannot be with the convoy because people sometimes don't appreciate the time scales that naval combat operates on so they're on top of the, you can see from the sort of the map here it looks like they're on top of the convoy but they're several hours from being you know right in amongst them and the amount of damage that a ship like Tirpitz or Scharnhorst could do both to the escort that the cruisers the destroyers etc and to the convoy itself in a few hours is huge mm. and th this heavy group they're not there specifically to have a big fight with Tirpitz. The objective of this convoy is not to sink a German battleship. If it happens, great, but they'd much rather Tirpitz stays home because of this risk of this risk of damage to the convoy. Because ultimately, if if the Germans send Tirpitz out and the heavy group sinks it, well, great, they don't have to worry about it again. But if in so doing, the first sign that they have that anything's wrong is Tirpitz shows up on the horizon and starts shelling the convoy. Even if Victorious then launches a, an airstrike and cripples it and King George V and Washington then show up and sink it, if in that interim period, Tirpitz has managed to wipe out half or three quarters of the convoy, the objective of getting the supplies to Russia has failed, regardless of anything else you've managed to do. And this this is the biggest set of nerves they've got going because, because of the damage that Tirpitz could do before anyone br brings it to, to heel. Yeah, and that could do. I mean, the, the, the mm. conversation, the sidebar there about whether it really is the threat or whether it's the perceived threat. Well, that's just that. That's it's the same thing, isn't it? If the, yeah. if the perceived threat is 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 what's important, whether or not there is actually a real threat, we can do that with the benefit of hindsight all these years later. But yeah. at the time, there is this perceived threat. Threat. So, yeah. so going back to the story, in case people think we're yeah. going too much in the, into the into the the rabbit holes there, mm -hmm. the, the order is given to scatter. What what yeah. that what then happens practically for the, all these merchant ships and all these the, the, the escorts that are left. So the idea is then for everyone who's left, who's going to Russia to proceed independently. And the objective of this is based pretty much on the Atlantic kind of scenario. If a German surface raider gets, gets near a convoy. And that is that if everybody scatters in all different directions, no matter how fearsome Tirpitz or potentially Scharnhorst is, it's only one ship. It can only hunt down ships one at a time and, to be fair, again, in the high Arctic, even in the middle of summer, it's not that easy to find anything. So it's effectively a damage control, damage mitigation exercise um, with the objective being that, well, yeah, we scatter our three dozen or so ships. If Tirpitz then finds and kills two or three of them, well, that sucks, but the rest of them get through as opposed to they're all in one place where they, Tirpitz can just pick them off one at a time like ducks. Mm. And the, the important thing to bear in mind here is that any of the German heavy surface units are massively, massively faster. They might as well be infinitely faster than the merchant ships, which means that if they're all caught in formation, it doesn't matter if they start running, Tirpitz and its escorts can still overhaul them, even if they take a 15, 20 minutes, half an hour to finish off the ship before them, they can still catch them. Whereas if they net scatter now, put a lot of distance between them, hopefully the, not all of them will be found. Um, the hilarious thing about it is, of course, that 
the combined the various convoy escort three convoy escort groups actually have more firepower than pretty much all of the Kriegsmarine at this point in time in terms of surface ships but as you say it's it's it there's there's all these various elements factoring into it but once they've scattered it's you've kind of got this catch 22 situation close up together they've got a really good defense against submarines and against aircraft through mass firepower mass sonar many escort ships but they're vulnerable to a capital ship scattered they're now largely immune to being all picked off by a single capital unit yeah but they are now pretty much every man for himself on his own and with the best will in the world a single destroyer a single corvette or worse still a single merchant ship is really not in a be good position to fend off multiple U-boats or squadrons of Luftwaffe attack aircraft. And this is what starts to now pick off the convoys because there's there's now effectively no defense against these efforts and the U-boats start having a go at them, the Luftwaffe starts having a go at them and ships just start dropping left, right and center. Um, and there's nothing really at this point that the escort groups can do because not only have the the heavier escort groups already turned back, they're Come now back, yeah. dozens or hundreds of miles away. Even if they turned around at this point, they'd never get there in time and they'd be subject to attacks themselves. But with the convoys scattered, there is no system in place on the Arctic convoys for a convoy to reform. There's no homing mm. beacon, no homing signal, no get agreed meeting point other than the ports they were heading to in the first place. Um so once that order to scatter is given, unless it's rescinded within half an hour, an hour or so, that's basically it. It's it's now the, the game is set in that manner. Yeah. I mean, that's maybe the good point. To, to, there's two comments that have come in that you, you're sort of addressing in that point. The Great Dominion saying, um, why could, wouldn't they fall back to a rally point such as Spitsburg and a regroup there? Uh, but you're saying that's kind of not possible with the technology. They, they, they don't have they can't really do that. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, in theory, you could ask everyone to divert, but you'd have to do that before the order to scatter was given. Um, also, Spitsbergen is still well within range of German attack units, whether they be aircraft, submarines, or surface units. So if the perceived threat is Tirpitz is coming, well, actually, it's better to scatter at that point, because if you hit head for Spitsbergen, remember Tirpitz at one point in its career does I go and shoot up Spitsbergen, um, if you're all stationary or near stationary at anchor and Turpit shows up, you're in an even worse position than you would have been out at sea. Um, so it, it, it's, it, this is kind of thing of in the, in hindsight, it would make perfect sense. It would take you, it wouldn't take you beyond the reach of the German U-boats and aircraft, but it'd take you further away from them. And it would give you a chance to conglomerate more escorts, but that's with the hindsight of knowing that's what the actual threat well, was. Well, I think that's what we, when we start at the top of the show about the fact this is discussed so much, I think it is possibly because it has that element of armchair historia where you say, well, do that, don't do that, we mm. do that. Oh, we're, 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 it's, it's gone okay now. It's, it, it does seem to be able to cure the problems with a couple of strokes of a pen and everything's okay. And of course, yeah. that, and, and that's not it's how because, it actually worked. No, and it's because, I think with this particular convoy, it's because the big threat they're reacting to doesn't actually exist. It actually exists, yeah. Um, and I think uh, I want to, make, sorry to, sorry to interrupt yeah. you there, the Marx of Sparks made a good point, and I'm going to elaborate on his question. He says, was it feasible for the Germans to send prize cute crews on turbots and heavy cruisers towards BQ-17? Surely the merchant men would have scuttled their ships rather than surrender their supplies. But I'm gonna I'll, I'll leave you with that question as well, mm -hmm. Drag. But also, from their point of view, what's their whole game plan when they when they are when they realise there's this massive great convoy coming? What are their? Well, we've looked at it from the Allied point of view, and mm -hmm. who is it? What are the Germans trying to do? What's their game plan? So the German game plan has changed a little bit. Back when the Atlantic raids were on, even when Bismarck sailed, there were significant prize crews aboard the ships. The crew numbers went up specifically for that. And that was because out in the Atlantic, you had the time potentially to haul the ship over and take it as a prize. And Germany could use the supplies, yeah. uh, to be perfectly honest. Now, in the Arctic, that is much less of, a viable proposition oddly enough although norway which is obviously german held is much closer the sea conditions in the arctic are usually much more against boarding 
And also the Germans are aware that, you know, whatever happens, these convoys are much more heavily escorted. So if Tirpitz pulled up or slowed down enough to dispatch a boarding party, that, in, especially in the visibility conditions that you sometimes get in the Arctic, would be a perfect opportunity for an escorting destroyer or two to slip in and send half a dozen torpedoes their way. Um, whereas out in the early the early stage of 39 40 early 41 on atlantic convoy routes there weren't anywhere near that many capable escorts that would even be kept physically able to do that kind of thing um and whilst yes some of these resources would be useful for the german war effort to be perfectly honest the germans are not going to do a tremendous amount with a shipment of shermans for which they have no spare parts they're they need to get everything, wouldn't they? they it's, yeah. it's, it, getting the odd ship would, would just end up being no. lots of stuff they don't need. So it's an, yeah. a, an all or nothing thing for them. So, yeah. And the, the yeah. time it takes you to capture a ship would extend the amount of time you're spent dealing with that ship, which means, yeah, you might capture two or three ships, but the other three dozen might get through. Get Whereas it, it's basically it's in their better interest just to blow them all out of the water uh, and have done with it which you, you can kind of see with the, the the amount of and type of crews that they have aboard. Un unfortunately, the a combination of the environment and the speed of World War II operations by this point means that the, the old rules of prize taking don't really apply so much here. Yeah. So, you know, we've got the image up of a very simplified image. There are more complicated mm. ones out there, folks, if you want to have a bit more detail. But this is... For those who don't know the subject, too, I thought it was the, the, a basic one to start with. So you can see the point, the point of the scattering. And these are all the ships that then suffer. So you know, run us through you know, the, the awful truth of what happened there. The, I mean, it was devastating. That the, and, and I mean, we, we don't want to do it necessarily ship by ship, but um, mm. broadly speaking, what happens over the next few hours? So you you start the sort of convoy commodore. Um, and various others are listening on the radio and they start to hear more and more signals coming in from various merchant ships who are reporting aircraft, submarines, um, the fact that their ships are sinking, etc. And it's, it's gradually escalating. There are a few small clutches of merchant ships that are sailing kind of vaguely together. And a lot, a lot of them get sort of in pairs and trios get taken out. Um, the Luftwaffe, obviously, with the fact they've got aircraft moving a little bit quicker than uh, than ships, are able to get there first. So they start putting ships down. But the the submarines are in the vicinity, so submarines start hitting hard as well. Um, some of the merchant ships do meet up with the occasional escort because obviously the close escort group's been ordered to scatter as well um and you know some of them think you know what the best thing to do is just to make a hard high speed break for the russian ports try and get ahead of everybody else on you know kind of the principle you don't have to be the fastest person in the group you just be fast faster than the guy behind faster you the last one yeah 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 um, some of them are trying to make sort of zigzag evasion routes, hoping that that will throw off pursuit. And uh, a handful of them actually end up doing a rather, rather crazy little little stunt. Um, one of the smaller escort vessels picks up three merchant ships, and they end up heading up north for the pack ice. And they decide the best thing to do is to play hide and seek. <laughs> with the, with the Germans, so they they get themselves locked up in the pack ice. Uh, they discover that one of the ships ha is carrying cargoes a cargo of white paint, amongst other things. Um, so they paint themselves all white, stretch a bunch of tarp over their decks, and pretend to be a series of icebergs. And just in case, because um, at least one of the ships, possibly more, is carrying Sherman tanks, they stick a bunch of them on the deck, load the guns, and prepare to fight what would possibly have been the world's most bizarre ship-to-ship -ship action had the Tirpitz actually shown up. Wow. Um, yeah. it, it's possibly a bit more of a morale-boosting effort than anything actually practical, given that the Sherman 75 mil is a, is a three-inch gun, which... At the, even at the best of times, is not a threat to something the size of Tirpitz, but you know the, the thought counts. As it turns out, their their efforts actually bear fruit in as much as this, because they spend their time literally chilling in the ice. 
by the time the ice lets go of them and they're able to proceed towards Russia, the main bulk of the German attacks is kind of over. The U-boats have expended their torpedoes, burnt through their fuel, begun to turn back. The Luftwaffe similarly are sort of re-arming, re, um, refueling, repairing, etc. And so when they eventually make their journey east and then south, there's much less opposition and they manage to make it into into safety. But for the vast majority of the ships, it's a case of, well, as I say, you're a merchant ship. If you're lucky, you might have a handful, a couple of anti-aircraft guns, and there's trained anti-shipping Luftwaffe attack units coming in, you know, the kind of units that can put down full-on warships that might have 10 times your anti-aircraft armament and have friends to help them. So the chances of any individual ship surviving once they come under that kind of assault basically relies on the Germans being horrific shots and as we can see from the number of casualties yeah and, and this is where, why you can end up with and there are lots of individual books out there folks about different merchant ships and escorts are involved in this that tell these stories from the point of view of individual commanders and captains and and, and officers on these ships there but it, it, the paradox of this is that that everybody involved in these whether it's their first convoy or their tenth this where convoys have started getting good is everybody working to this same plan it's not about improvisation it's about sticking to a game it's like the b-17s or lancasters flying into germany isn't it it's about mm. providing that 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 network of protection all those guns firing at the same time in a, in a formation that where you're self-protecting and now because of the scatter order which we've sort of we've sort of justified it with mm. reservations if i'm kind of understanding mm. you correctly sort of we can understand it more than justified i think it would be maybe how i'd work yes yeah i think this is one of the things i come down to a lot when it comes to some of the slightly odder events of world war ii just because something seems to be completely insane it may not it may not be justifiable but it may be explicable um yeah it's and, about, you, about using the information at the time, yeah. but trying to put yourself in that moment, in that there, with that information you have there, trying to forget what you know happened later on and say, okay, let's see if we can examine why this decision was made. And I think, yeah, I think that's how I would say it. We can understand it without necessarily justifying it or, exp or exp you know, it, we're, we're baffled yeah. by the, because we know what happened, but at the same time, mm. you can kind of see why, why it was done. Yeah, and one, one oh, of the other things, sorry. the sort of the softer factors, I guess, which I don't think anyone's ever going to be able to fully comprehend as to how much how much of an effect it had, is that ultimately the order to scatter and all this the stuff that's coming out of the Admiralty is under the control of Admiral Pound, and Admiral Pound is a pretty good admiral, and various people have said it seems very uncharacteristic of him to make this kind of mistake. But the thing we've got to remember is that very shortly after this, Admiral Pound would have to retire and very shortly thereafter die from a brain tumour. So he had this, what would turn out to be very shortly fatal brain tumour rapidly developing at the time that PQ-17 was going on. Um, now, obviously, he, he didn't necessarily, I don't know whether he knew it at the time, he might have done, um, but that kind of thing, as we know, does affect somebody's judgment. Yeah. How much, how far was it developed? How much did it affect his judgment? Would he have done things differently if he hadn't been suffering from that? We don't know, but it's another one of these random variables that it's we, a variable that that we have to mix. consider. I mean, and, and interesting, David O'Keefe was talking about Pound a lot earlier in the mm. sidebar there, and 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 his I'm, I'm not gonna say he's he's against this policy, but he's he's not a He's not a fervent supporter of the whole Arctic convoy principle. Is that if that's fair to say, isn't it? I suppose. Yeah. Well, I mean, the 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 convoys in 1942, the Allies are not doing particularly brilliantly. Um, up until, I mean, we, bear in mind we're only part way through 42 at this point. Um, but the Japanese, for the most part apart from uh, Midway, which the lessons of and occurrence of which is only just beginning to filter through, the Japanese have seemed to be mostly unstoppable in the Pacific. Yeah. That's diverting, obviously, a lot of US resources, but also a lot of British resources to that area. Um, the war in the Mediterranean is going okay, but the Italians are still a major threat. Yeah. Um, 
similarly, the war in the desert is doing its usual back and forth seesawing at this point. It could, could um, kind of go either way at that point, couldn't it? Stalingrad yeah. could kind of, well, it's not quite, but yeah. it could go either way. The, there's lots of, 42, as David O'Keefe often says, is, a, is an mm. under-examined, under-talked about year of the war yeah. where lots of things were on a, maybe we now don't think they were quite as much on the knife edge as they seemed at the time, but at the time, and it's back to the, I was talking to you, Trap, before we went live, mm when we talked with Brian on Monday about the crisis, is mm. crisis the correct word? Because crisis has an emotional uh, un word, you know, understanding to it. And does crisis imply panic? Does critical is a better word? Before the middle of 42 is a really, really interesting word yeah. year or period that where you can kind of understand because they've only got the recent history to look at behind them. Like we now have the next two years to look ahead of them where we can see things turning, but they don't have that. They haven't got a, a you know, crystal ball there. So it's, mm. it's trying to kind of, from our historical point of view, stop the clock in the summer of 42 and try and look at it at that time there. And as, as David O'Keefe mm. said a minute ago, historians have a, you know, we're talking about whether or not it was the right decision or, historians should say what happened not what could have happened or happened. should have happened or might have happened it's all we can yeah. do is discuss what actually happened so yeah you know, and this is this is one of the things that influences admiral pound's decision because it's, it's also you've got to remember the battle of the atlantic is by no means won. it's still deteriorating despite the um despite the fact that you've got more escorts you've now got the u.s navy involved you've got new and better aircraft coming in you've got western approaches command working at full tilt it's still not going brilliantly um, over in uh, over in in the Atlantic, and on top of that, you, because although obviously the Americans getting involved is useful for, in terms of more ships coming in, you've also got the second happy time kicking off and mm -hmm. and going on on the western coast of the U.S. So the Arctic convoys, whilst they are important for all the reasons we've discussed they are diverting merchant ships and escorts from the Atlantic where, you know, from a purely selfish perspective, the British would probably much rather they be. Bearing in mind that the original um, proposal for the Arctic convoys was for the Russians to provide the ships and the Allies to provide the escorts. And then the Russians turned around and said, we, we have no merchant ships, comrade. <laughs> so it yeah. went from kind of being, supposing to having originally been kind of a joint effort to, then being a mostly allied with some Russian support effort to by this point it's allied merchant Western and allied merchant ships, Western allied escorts, Western allied heavy escorts, and Russian presence basically being limited to air patrols and a few destroyers and such like coming out at the tail end of the journey once most of the German attacks mm. have passed. I mean, this is that, yeah, again, my, my kind of metaphor or parable is that it's more being Peter to pay Paul a lot in 1942. Mm. Wherever, wherever we put our strength, we're having to take it from somewhere else that needs it just as much. And it's like, okay, so let's put some strength there. Let's, t let's put some more in the med, but that leaves us short there. Let's, and it's the same, you know, the same with the air, the strategic air campaign as well. If we're, if we're bombing this bit, it means we haven't got bombers over this bit. By the time we get to early 45 or even, even midway through 44, when people say, how many bombers do you want? Well, how many, you know, how many, how many do you want? We've got hit, how many, you know, we've got them all. Mm. Every, everything that we wished we could have had in 42, we have in 44, 45, the resources, yeah. but this is still little 42 when yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, if you concentrate on this one, it's spinning plates, isn't it? I think yeah. you know, yeah. you know, we've, we've got this bit, we've got the, we've got the Arctic convoy. Oh shit. We're leaving ourselves a bit exposed Atlantic. Hang on the med. So we go back and spin that. Yeah, it's, it's as, as Dave O'Keefe was pointing out, the Darwin is stretched well beyond its maximum capability because yeah. they've gone into this war with a plan of we can fight any two nations and with our allies, the French. Yeah, so that they're planning to have a Royal Navy yeah. Marine National combined force and they're thinking, great, well, with that, if we go to war with Italy and Japan or Germany and Japan or Germany and Italy or for some bizarre reason, Italy and Japan, we can fight... a a war on two fronts and now the royal navy's found itself fighting a war on three different fronts well against three different nations the germans the italians and the japanese the americans at this point they're only just about getting into it and most of their effort is trying to stem the japanese advance into the mm. pacific and they now find themselves as you say that you they're, they're fighting the arctic convoys they're fighting the battle of the atlantic the, there's still 
elements of the blitz going on over Britain, although it's mostly pieced out by by mid forty two. Um, you've got the battles in the desert campaign. You've got um, U boats and German surface raiders everywhere. That's not the North Atlantic as well. Um, and now you've got the Japanese coming. You've got Singapore falling. Um, Force Z obviously at the tail end of forty one. Um, they're they're basically having to fight a war on about a dozen different fronts yeah. with half the forces they thought they were going to yeah, have available. The Eastern Seaboard of the USA as well. I think we haven't mentioned yeah. that one yet. I mean, it's just so much going on. But a good point. Well, I think it's a good point for my mm -hmm. limited understanding. Um, uh, Pat just asked, um, what about any meaningful air cover from the Soviets or indeed any other support? I mean, at the mm -hmm. end of the day, this convoy is coming to, to bring stuff to them. Uh, mm -hmm. They've been not involved in the story today to date is that is that just because they don't have the resources in the right area basically they don't have the resources they also don't have the right kind of resources um the the numbers of aircraft that the luftwaffe had destroyed by um the, the the yeah the number of red aircraft that the luftwaffe had destroyed in the opening stages of barbarossa is massive now okay you could argue that they've probably done the russians a favor by wiping the slate of a bunch of obsolete aircraft but it the russians are still struggling to catch up with those losses they've got to deal with the luftwaffe across a massive front you know with people actually invading their homeland yeah um as we said they've got the manufacturing issues of the fact a bunch of the factories are in the process of being moved and even even if we ignore all of that the kind of aircraft that the Russians need to fight on the the Eastern Front, uh, or I guess for them is probably the Western Front, um, yeah. the low-level attack fighters, um, IL-2 style ground attack aircraft, etc. No use for this. Yeah, yeah they're no use for long-range maritime reconnaissance. And the, the few big, heavy four-engine or three-engine Russian um, bombers and such that might have served as like a halfway house stopgap for this kind of thing mostly got have been blown up or shot down and they have no real need to build more of them at this point um, they have better things for their aircraft factories to do and to be perfectly honest um, the, the Luftwaffe is pretty good at this point at long-range heavy fighter operations, um, whether that be BF-110s or converted JU-88s. So sending, I don't know, a bunch of converted TB-3s out is just asking for them to be shot down as well. So the, the best the Russians can do is um, some closer range air cover at the tail end um, of, the, of the convoy route, but as we can see, it's kind of it's not many ships are reach, it's reaching that point. Too late by then, isn't it? So yeah, for those for those who you know who, who don't know the, the the statistics, I mean, what what are we talking about in the loss of this convoy? It's about two thirds of the merchant ships, or is it slightly more than that? Um, well, yeah, it's 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 not good by any measure, certainly. Um, if I be believe, yeah, it's two dozen merchant ships sunk. Um, and give them a, bear in mind they've got just they've got 35 so it's just a very minor fraction over two-thirds wow of the of the of the shipping center, which is the kind of casualty levels that um you don't really see in any other convoys except for some of the malta convoys and you know with, with those th those are run through with the specific um sort of predisposition that we're going to lose a bunch of them so at least mm. one or two getting through is a good whereas this convoy has been run on the basis of we actually expect most of it to get through so it's a it's quite this quite a significant loss and also just in sheer numbers because you can't replace it it's not just the cargo it's the ships themselves you know you can't mm. replace the ships and 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 ironically, the third of supplies that perhaps do get there without the supplies that have been lost, are they even, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, kind of like um, wheelbarrows without the wheels. I mean, that's a ridiculous mm. example there. But the point is, as we talked about, this convoy has been carefully balanced to have all these elements. So now a third of it arriving is like, well, what are we going to do with this? Yeah. Without the other stuff to go with this, we can't use this. I mean, I'm sure yeah, it, they were able to use some of it, but it's, it's, it's the whole thing has defeated its own purpose. Yeah, because I mean, if it, if it, if the the ship that let's say the ship that was carrying the vital machine tools has gone down, well, then a lot of the rest of that is far less useful. It, and it, even with things like tanks and aircraft, 
if you've sent enough tanks to equip a regiment and you now have enough tanks to equip a platoon or a few yeah. squadrons, it's like, or well, you a, don't a, have a spare parts because a spare yeah. part's been lost, or you don't have the ammunition for the guns. But it, it, it will, you know, it's, yeah. You, and as we found out with John McKay yesterday, that that some of the survivors of this con, that this convoy didn't go back till that they they joined the ones of the return from PQ eighteen. So they were weeks, mm -hmm. if not months, in in Murmansk and Russia and and, and Archangel. So everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. We we should have had we had a question about what the, the actual Royal Naval losses were as well. We talked about the merchant ships, so not as bad as the merchant ships. No, there were a few. Weirdly enough, there were a few of the escorts that were damaged. Um, but as far as I'm aware, none of the actual escorts, the, as in the full military escorts, were actually sunk. Um, it partly because you know they're slightly better able to take care of themselves, and partly because the Germans quite sensibly were focusing on the big merchant ships. Because ultimately, you know, if a if a little anti-submarine warfare trawler shows up that's not going to be much use to the russians um at attacking an anti-aircraft ship or a destroyer that's maneuvering at high speed and firing off all its guns is much more risky to you and again doesn't really deprive the russians of all that much but if you go after the big slow wallowing tanker or cargo ship that's that's a few miles up uh, along that's going to do a lot more damage and you know less likely that you're going to end up in the arctic sea which mm. you know most german pilots do have a survival <laughs> instinct yeah and I think what's coming up in the sidebar now as well is there's mm. the there's as we talked about at the beginning of the show there's the practical loss of ships the practical loss of supplies but there's now this propaganda backfire as well as David O'Keefe making the point that people in the factories in the UK and I guess in Canada are being told in part you're making stuff that's going to help Uncle Joe is going that and then you you find out that the, the stuff you made didn't get there and then the, it, there's a there's a hot and that's just the the as far as the public and the propaganda, then we have the implication on this because we, you know, I'll ask you to talk about the mm. because the Americans are here. The Americans are part of this, and they've they've mm. watched this unfold. And uh, it's interesting, folks. We're talking about these um, interesting people involved in this. Douglas Fairbanks Jr., the Hollywood actor, son of Douglas Fairbanks, the first Robin Hood, and all that stuff. Mm. He was on um, the Wichita, and uh, mm. you know, he wrote he wrote in his diary after this, "What kind of high command have we that such." that with such great force in operation, we cannot fight it out. So that's kind of a sense of, a, of an American obser observer that mm. the, the British, the British, quote, unquote, are not fighting back. And do you think that kind of feeling was universal amongst these the, the U.S. naval involvement, that the British had, in a sense, turned a tail and, and ran? Certainly in the, in the upper echelons of U.S. Navy command, because um, one of the, the things you've got to, define things a little bit in terms of what was written retrospectively yeah, yeah. as opposed because um for, for fairbanks aboard wichita he wouldn't have had any more information than the captains and commodores in fact less because they're not exactly going to go turn around and tell him as to why what was happening was happening and being on a heavy cruiser he wouldn't have seen what happened to the merchant ships he would have heard about it afterwards um Whereas, obviously, someone like Admiral King, who, as we said before, was not particularly well disposed to the British in the first place, watching all this go down is, uh, shall we say, far from impressed by the entire thing. So there are questions being asked in the upper echelons of the US naval hierarchy. There's some questions being asked in the sort of the actual US Navy elements for as long as they're around, because King pulls a lot of them back into the Pacific shortly thereafter. Um, but that that's more as, as news comes in. I think that there probably would have been a certain element, though, at the time that they were turning back of why are we doing this? Because, um, as I said, the combined escort force had more firepower surface in terms of surface ships than the entire Kriegsmarine practically at this point. And that much, at least, they would have known. Um, you know, the the destruction of Bismarck was a public thing. The fact that the Germans only had Tirpitz as their big capital ship was publicly known. Um, obviously, there's Scharnhorst around as well, but, you know, 
Sharnhorst is a good ship, but is it going to win a fight against King George V of Washington? I don't think so. Well, Duke of York rather decisively proves that point in at the end of 1943. Um, so, especially amongst the heavier units, the cruisers and the battleships, they would have known what kind of force they had to play with, and they would have known roughly what kind of force the Germans could have brought out to play with. So I think from that perspective, seeing everyone basically drop everything and run and run for the four winds just because a single German battleship was coming out, that probably would have played somewhat badly to, to both to both navies, actually, the Royal Navy and the US Navy, um, especially considering the response to Bismarck coming out about a year, just over a year before, had been yeah. send in send in the navy to kit to kill it. Um Th this would have seemed like a bit of a step back on that attitude. And it's interesting for those who did watch yesterday's show. Now you've understand folks, how much pressure there was on Charlie's convoy PQ 18, uh, three months later to, to, to the world is watching. Now everybody's watching with their arms folded saying, well, let's ha let's see what they've learned from that, which is a good point to ask you track. What lessons were learned from this? I mean, th there's, there's certain bits of, you know, we could we we could talk about Pound and his brain tumor. We mm. could talk about uh, getting information. See, but there there must be some practical things you can say. Okay, can we can we implement some kind of system to improve our reaction to these things? Was there anything that you can see that was actually okay? Next time we're going to make sure we've got mm. this. So th there's three things that broadly come out of this. One is. A decision not to sail convoys for the moment during the summer hours when you've got 24-7 um, near enough light because a, a lot of people point out and quite correctly that if this had happened in October or November or February with the much greater amount of darkness even if everything else had gone exactly the same there simply wouldn't have been the hours of of the day for the, just the time to do the damage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the ships would have survived more there. The second thing that comes out of it is there's a definite appreciation that more accurate intelligence on what's going on with the German heavy units is needed. Um, or as we've, we've mentioned earlier, some of the reasons why they lost exact tracking on things like Tirpitz, but it, it it means that you've got this combination of we need to know more what they're doing and we also need to focus more on trying to take it out. So you get things like the X-Craft and the aircraft carrier assaults and obviously culminates with 617 dropping tall boys much later down the line. Um, but the the third thing I think that really comes out of, of this whole mess um, is that they need a slightly different balance of escort to go with the ships because by this point everyone is beginning to appreciate just how powerful aircraft can be i mean that is a lesson that they've learned the hard way over the past yeah. few months to years yeah. um but this, this kind of drives home the point for this theater so they're looking at it going well we can't risk a fleet carrier the entire way but when we do this again now the escort carriers coming online, we do need some of those escort carriers to go with go all the way with the or near enough with the convoys, because they can provide um, anti-submarine air, air aircraft to help deal with the U-boat threat, and more critically, they can provide fighter cover, and mm. that is actually more important because ships can do the anti-submarine warfare effort, but yeah. the fighters they can shoot down recon aircraft. They can so they can make sure the convoy isn't found in the first place. They can break up and shoot down German attack aircraft, and torpedo bombers are far less agile than fighters. And when it comes to you know, if the big surface units appear, they can find them a lot further out than convoy escort pickets can. And the few anti-submarine aircraft that are aboard uh, later escort carriers, mostly swordfish. You know, they can be switched over to a torpedo bombing role. And in extremis, even if you don't necessarily have torpedoes aboard, the Germans have learned to worry a little bit when they see swordfish mm. lumbering over mm. the horizon. Um, and so it has a deterrent effect, if nothing else, um, if German surface units come out to play. 
And I think you know, I'm, I'm reading the, the comments there again. And David O'Keefe, who is Mister mm. Don't Go Counterfactual, but tonight actually is going counterfactual. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a couple of things he's saying. One is, um, if Turpitz's radio traffic had been readable, that could change everything completely because maybe Pound has the confidence to go and hunt it down. And suddenly, it becomes an opposite type of result where we. So that, but that we we but we couldn't. We mm. read the messages, so therefore that's sort of. It's just yeah. a counterfactual. I think um, if if they had though, it is an interesting one because Turpitz does sail. Um, it does in the event actually sail to try and intercept the convoy, although it sails the day after the convoy has scattered because it's supposedly come out, and then it, it turns back and, and heads home. Um if the convoy hadn't scattered on on the fourth and had kept going, the heavy units would have pulled back at some point around about that time anyway. Yeah. But they still would have been in the area. If Turpitz, if if all the message traffic had been readable and they'd known Turpitz was either about to sail or when it had sailed, they may very well have diverted the heavy covering force a little bit south to see if they could have a crack at it. Realistically, Turpitz heading home fairly soon thereafter being recalled, probably nothing would have happened. Um but at the same time, you know, given that the Germans did figure out pretty quickly the convoy had scattered, if I suppose you could go counter counter to that and say, well, if the Germans knew that the convoy was still together, but the heavy units had vanished into the ether, maybe the Turpits would mm. continue on its journey north. And maybe there would have been uh, another great battleship fight in in the Arctic. I mean, um, this is this interesting thing about the little, the little slight changes of, of variables and you have completely different outcomes that therefore can completely shape the outcome of, of the war mm. in this theater. But that's, you know, it's all going, going down a discussion that perhaps mm. another day, but um, I, I think I, at the beginning of the show, I made this sort of comparison to talking about perhaps something like operation market garden Arnhem. The difference being, of course, Arnhem, we only have Arnhem to look at. We, we, it's mm. not like we did a rematch a few weeks later. Go, okay, <laughs> well, the, the thing about the Arctic convoys is because of PQ-18 and others, there is a mm. chance to put into play what there's learned. The, you can see that there is a, there is a rematch effectively mm. three months later. So unfortunately with World War II, you do get these cases where the learning curve is steep. And mm. at these tragic events, when lots of ships are, and lots of lives are lost, and we you know we mustn't, we must pay a few seconds to talk about the the, the many many lives lost in this in a very mm. very horrible place to die. But lessons have been learnt from it, and PQ eighteen, thankfully, Charlie survived that, and PQ eighteen had some incidents and a couple of losses, but but was was much more successful. So as uh, to, to kind of just conclude things for for this evening. How many more Arctic convoys are there? There and and obviously nothing gets as worse as PQ seventeen. So that there, there are there is an improvement. There is a there is a trajectory upwards of success rate. That's fair to say. Yes. Yeah. So um, the convoys continue all the way through to the end of the war. Actually, um, the the PQ series does get retired um relatively quickly pq pq18 is the last of the pq convoys and uh, in part it's retired because of you know the disaster that is pq17 everyone's going to be thinking oh am i going to be the next one they're replaced with the jw series um and they, they those go on although the number of jw convoys does reduce um there's only four i think in um 1945 um, but they do keep keep on going. I mean, it gives you some idea of just how bad this particular disaster was in that just under a third of all merchant ships lost on the entire Arctic convoy operation were lost in this one this convoy. One convoy yeah. um, so, that, that yeah, it, it's quite bad. But the convoy operations, it, as I like to point out quite a lot when it comes to you know, a lot of stuff in World War Two. It's not a relatively simple game of the enemy has done this, therefore we do this to counter them, and that is it. it, it it's very much more that kind of sort of primary school playground game that kids play, where, you know, one person puts their hand in, then the next person, then the next, and the next, and that's, and it eventually just usually just ends into a slap fight. Um, but it's it's that kind of thing that's going on all over World War II, and, and including the Arctic convoys, in that 
the Allies will do one thing, the Germans will do something to counter it. The Allies now have to react to that and counter that, but the Germans will come up with something new. And so there's this constantly escalating um, attempts by both sides to get the edge over the other. Um, so you convoys get ever more complex, the escorts get ever stronger, the Germans keep trying newer, new tactics, new technology, new weapons, everyone's adapting to that. So by the time of sort of some of the high-end uh, JW series convoys in late 44, sort of in the 50s and 60s, those convoys are, are completely different in appearance from the convoys that uh, make up the PQ series. And it's also fair to say that, that you're saying there's the Germans are doing what they can to improve it, but that their ability to improve things dramatically starts tailing off come 44 or 45. I mean, that Brian Walter talked about that, and we've talked about the other shows. They just they're 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 they haven't got the resources anymore. They haven't got the time to invent new things. So all the time we're div we're improving and fine tuning all our things. We go into the, all the discussions of sonar and radar and ASDIC and all these improvements and mm. depth charge improvements, everything else that we're doing. The Germans kind of get to a point where they kind of level off and and, and nothing gets better anymore. Um, but just I want before we kind of finish mm -hmm. off, there's a couple of um, German photos of the art. What we've talked about the the, the strain on U.S. Uh, Anglo-US relations. We talked about the, the maybe a morale issue in the UK. For the Germans, though, how did they treat this? I mean, because we know that they love their U-boat crews. And we've talked about mm. that on other World War II TV shows. They love their newsreel footage of their their U-boats leaving Lorient and Brest and Saint Nazaire and and all that. They love their returning. Mm -hmm. They must have had an absolute propaganda field day with this. But is it in a sense of them? celebrating something because as we as i just said it's all going to get worse for the major one this is this is a false dawn for them really isn't it? it it appears to be a victory and it was a victory in this one convoy but eventually they're just not about to compete against our resources so it's a it, it, it it's it's against the it's against the flow of the war really isn't it this victory yeah them. i mean they they are very happy with the result they know how many merchant ships they've killed. I mean, obviously, there's the usual overestimation and everything, but even with that factory in, they know they've done a lot of damage to this convoy. Um, and in some ways, it yeah, it does offer them at least some temporary hope because they realize very soon after that no more convoys are coming, as we said, and, and until three months later, three months, yeah, 18. Of, of so, so, wounds, yeah. so that they're going back and saying, Look, we've actually managed to hit the the, this thing so hard that the allies have given up as far as they're concerned they think they've they've actually done it because they've been trying to you know they've been trying to disrupt convoys to malta they've been trying to disrupt convoys to the uk they've been trying to disrupt convoys left right and center and although they're having varying levels of success and inflicting varying levels of casualties the allies are being incredibly stubborn by keep running the blasted convoys yeah we, can, um, we, we never stop yeah yeah, yeah. whereas in after pq17 it appears for a while that they that the allies have stopped so for the Germans, this is kind of sort of their, right, this is how much damage we need to do to a convoy to stop them, um, which gives them some impetus going into the latter part of 42, thinking it is actually possible that that, that they'll be able to, to pull these things off. And, you know, in the Atlantic, it does get quite bad at the end, towards the end of 1942. But ultimately, um, yeah, they're, what the as you say the convoys start up again eventually um they still do their their best and it, norway i think is one of the slightly more forgotten elements because uh, i mean nowhere is safe um until the end of world war 2 but the arctic convoys remain one of the less safe areas of operations partly because of the harsh conditions they're operating in and partly because Whilst, you know, in the Mediterranean, you've got the invasion of Italy going on, which is driving access control out of, out, and Italy bang out, drives a lot of access control out of the Mediterranean. You've got the, the 1944 D-Day uh, offensive into Western Europe, which is cutting off a lot of the Germans' ability to attack into the Atlantic. But Norway is never invaded. Um, the Germans have large numbers of forces in Norway because they're worried the Allies are going to invade yeah. it. But Norway ends up, as far as German-occupied Norway, just basically having to surrender at the end of the war. So it's one of the last sort of holdouts of continuous uh, German offensive action. 
I want to do a, a Norway week at some point in World War II mm. TV because not only as a nation, but as a geographical feature, I think it's underappreciated its role in World War II, its influence. I mean, we had, you know, your friend Alexander Clark on and my mm. friend now as well, Dr. Clark, talking mm. about the 1940 events. And 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 the, I think about the only thing the average person kind of knows about Norway is is heavy water and, mm. and the, the, the German potential atomic program but that norway to me has a lot more role a lot more influence in everything there's an element of norway having as you said there you know when we talk about operation overlord in june in, in normandy there are german troops in norway because they think it might be coming there that's affecting the gameplay in normandy there everything everything connects to norway in some small way but that small way is significant and i think mm. worthy of discussion so it's um yeah definitely do a week on norway but i think uh, just to kind of round things off, in that period between July and uh, the, you know this this, this mm -hmm. disastrous convoy here and September, yeah. was there any suggestion of let's not even do these at all? Let's you know our our commitment to the Soviets. If we're going to you know going back to plate spinning analogy, if we're going to mm -hmm. let a plate drop to the floor, should it not just be this one? And we'll just say we can't do it, and 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 just say we'll 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 revise it and come back to it later. I mean, uh, three months meant they did revise it, but was there ever a point of thinking, yeah, we're just we're just going to stop this at all? We can't do it. We can't. The risk is too great. They, I don't think they were ever thinking about not doing convoys at all. But what they were doing was the first thing they did was look at as there any other way we can get stuff to Russia, and there were a couple of other supply routes. There was. A little bit of um, there was a little bit of supply, believe it or not, across the northern Pacific, yeah, um, because Russia wasn't at war with Japan at this point, so Russian flagships could transit that area. There was also supplies via Iran going up that way into the southern USSR, which came up uh, in the sidebar a minute ago, yeah, yeah. So, but so they they looked at these, but neither of those routes offered really the same level of transport capacity that the Arctic route would. Um, plus the you know the morale and the political side. Well, I think that's the important thing. Is it? It's it's admitting that you've you've not only been defeated, but you mm. you're not even going to try again. That try I again, think yeah. we're back this whole idea at the beginning of there's a there's a there's a dipl diplomatic propaganda morale issue here. We have promised stuff. It it gives us a weak a weaker bargaining position with Stalin and the Soviets for other things that are going mm. on as well, because lots of yeah. things have got still to be resolved. And we could do an entire show, by the way, folks, on how exactly the Allies cooperated with the Russians, because it's very complicated with mm. these advisors and diplomats and ambassadors and what they would say to each other. It's not like the Brits and Americans just kind of shared. And even the leaders, mm. as we know from the films, you know, Churchill could speak to FDR on the phone directly. The Russian... I know we have the official meetings at Yalta, but the the, de the way we dealt with the Russians was lots and lots of red tape and hoops and mm. kind of standing in waiting rooms and an advisor coming out and giving part of the message, the message and going back in. And it was a very, very complicated process. And this, if we'd given up this, it's going to affect that whole diplomatic relationship, which is frayed and well, not fray, but it's, it's strained in the middle of the war. It was strained at the yeah. end of the war, I guess. But, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the one of the I think the two things you got to remember with this is that whilst they knew they had to restart the convoys, they were very definitely looking at we need to do something better. Yeah. So they they laid out a number of preconditions so to restart these convoys. We need this that we didn't ha have before. They end up having to walk back on a few bits and pieces of it, most of which involve the Russians doing a bit more because the Russians point out that. Well, they can't, um, and they don't really want to either, to be perfectly honest, because they've got bigger things to worry about. Because, again, you know, German troops on the home soil is slightly more worrying. Um, but the the other thing that, when it comes to all of this, really, is whilst there was... It's again, it's one of these kind of middle grounds. As, as you mentioned, the relationship between the Soviet Union and the rest of the Allies was very complicated. It wasn't, you know, cold, almost like Cold War, but levels of distrust. We just happen to be fighting a common enemy. But at the same time, um, you do have Churchill's quote, um, if I remember it correctly, or I may be paraphrasing slightly, that um, if Hitler invaded hell, I should find cause to make favorable reference to the devil. Um, mm. it, 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 
it was literally we will take anyone and everyone regardless of who they are as long as they fight hitler and the nazis um so stalin was not a natural ally of the west um no. and it was and, so and we knew that i mean yeah, was, everyone was aware in this to serve their own interests everyone yeah they're, they're pretending they're not but everyone is in mm. this for what they're going to get out of it their own immediate yeah safety of their own ways of life and there's everyone knows that the the uncle joe and churchill and smiling and fdr is all mm. for the camera i mean the public perhaps don't know but everybody yeah. behind the scenes knows it's all just a for show but yeah but uh, i think i think we as part of that we also have to remember that there, that there are multiple levels of this there's the political side where you know that they they just as soon to be sinking daggers into each other's back as the minute yeah, that exactly, yeah. is gone but at the same time at the sort of the if you like the the personal level, the lower level, the interactions of individual squadrons in the individual ships, crewmen, etc., there was quite a lot of camaraderie on that human level, um, and there yeah. were a lot oh, of yes. Russians who yeah, still yeah. remember yeah. that the the the, the, Ar the Arctic convoys very fondly, and a lot of you know a lot of Western sailors who went there who remember the well, Russians. Well, that came up fondly. in the discussion yesterday with John McKay about it was mm. about the Russians, the Russians instigating the the, the medal in two thousand and fourteen for mm. the Arctic convoy rather than our own government so there's another you know the russian and, and we i've met americans who met um russians on the elba in 45 and how mm. how genuinely warm they felt that 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 connection was there so that's that that level because that's soldiers soldiers mm. who are soldiers and sailors who have been in the in the thick of it together have that bond that if they've been fighting the same enemy they don't see the fact that the Soviets are a communist nation and we're a whatever. They're just seeing mm. the fact we've been doing exactly the same job in the same situation against the same enemy. So they've got a, a united um, a shared experience that's going to make their 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 appreciation different. But I think I want to end on a good I think it's a new viewer to the channel, mm -hmm. uh, Murdio Lu 81 um, mm -hmm. Everyone knows PQ-17 because of its sensationist uh, and the German propaganda. But the other convoys, the JW convoys, no, I think we I think we have tackled that tonight. We've brought people mm -hmm. in because of this sensational story of one convoy suffering such tragic results. But as Brian said on Monday, and as you talk about a lot on your channel, in the grand scheme of things, the Arctic convoys were successful. In the grand scheme of things, the Battle Atlantic, as Brian said on Monday, many, many more convoys got through that didn't than didn't. Many, many ships did make it that were that compared to those that were sunk. The data bears this out. So and we kind of have to play by the rules of the general public in the sense that we will bring the general public in by talking about a I'm going to use the word dramatic, exciting story, but we've used it to actually talk about the greater context of its importance and 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 the learning curve and these greater relationships i think that's important to set it in a context of saying don't just focus on the loss of this one convoy because there's a there's a greater story there that that it, that is is worth considering and examining and understanding so i think well it's been a lively um conversation on the side mm -hmm. as david o'keefe who i has yet to be stumped on anything and the, <laughs> we didn't quite go down the whole pinch rabbit hole that we could have done mm -hmm. because of course that does affect. We we could go down the whole Dieppe Enigma pinch raid stuff because that is affected by this. I mean, the the fact we can't understand the Tirpitz's radio traffic is is significant and was was to have significant ramifications of this convoy there, which adds weight to David's argument about this the 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 reasons the Allies absolutely need to get four rotor Enigma technology mm. sooner rather than later for many reasons, not just naval but broadly speaking to win the war so we'll we'll do that another time but right now i think we'll let things um end but yeah for those watching this by drax standards is a very short quick <laughs> because on drax yeah. channel which is phenomenally successful the link is in the description but you will talk for three or four hours about a subject much more narrow than than the the way we tackle it at world war ii tv so if you if you've been impressed by drax incredible knowledge and incredible uh, dedication to the subject I mean, I bet everybody watching has already discovered his channel. This is like a a, a, a lowly street busker t telling someone else about the Beatles. But <laughs> oh, I don't think there that. is anybody watching who doesn't know Drax's channel. Go there and you'll get some really, really amazing discussions about all aspects of naval history, not just World War II, because you're a bit of an all-rounder, aren't you? Yeah, as long as it's pre-1950 and it involves the Navy in some way, I'm quite happy to cover and it. grey floaty things and you're in, aren't you? Yeah. Really? <laughs> 
Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's I I I'm, I really like to focus on the the technology, the tactics, and and the strategy of of what's going on. Um, but the thing is, yeah, people watch my channel for that. But um, equally, you know, um, I, I'm I'm I'll be the first to admit I'm not the world's best at the human element of things. As hum humans are the odd squishy things that man the that, that man oh, the, the big man, interesting the, the, the steel the, things. Walk about on a boat uh, on the ships, spoiling the photos from your yeah. getting in the way of the. I bet when you look at a photo of people that you're thinking he's in the way of the the bit there. I can't see the, the which gauge wire is holding that thing there because of that yeah. bloody bloke being standing there. Whereas <laughs> John McKay last night is looking how amazing the fraught faces of that guy there cracking ice it's difficult yeah. different how we perceive things and how we look at it but yeah yeah your technical uh nous is is evident and yeah i recommend your channel and uh i'm gonna be watching your show with john parcel about about midway or two shows because uh, mm. i've got john coming up on a midway show later in the month and, yeah. and um we won't be going to your level of detail but anyway it's been a fascinating talking to you and i'm i'm grateful that you will lower yourself to join my little humble <laughs> channel anytime we do have people watching us who aren't the naval buffs that mm. you have on yours. So from from that's there are some people who don't know you from my viewers because I do a mm. slightly different thing. So I'm very grateful that you would come on and do this. It's great. And I think someone just said we should do the order to scatter order to scatter the uh, the live stream now. That's it. <laughs> Fair the enough. order has come from the Adelbury. Everybody's on their own now for the re yeah. for the rest of the evening. Go about your separate ways. We will reconvene tomorrow. So I will yeah. We've got, while well, we mind people we've got coming out, I'll come and say goodbye to you in a minute second. So tomorrow we've got, we're concluding Battles at Sea Week with Ian Ballantyne talking about the Bismarck. So we're kind of back into Atlantic again. He's written a trilogy of books about the Bismarck, probably the British uh, expert on the Bismarck. I guess there are probably Germans, historians as well. But from the British point of view, Ian Ballantyne is amazing. So same time tomorrow night, folks. We'll try and wrap it up before the Belgium game uh, for euros but we'll see how that goes but anyway as usual thank you for watching check us out on tw uh, twitter check us out on facebook i was on my pa my podcast with we have ways of making you talk was out today check me out me out on that with james holland al murray check out drax website uh, uh, youtube channel it's in the description below your for your naval history um and i will see you all tomorrow but right now it means me to say thank you very much to uh, to drag for joining us and um have you enjoyed it yes definitely Definitely. Good. So um, it's good. You're not in charge. I'm yeah. in the one in charge today. You're just answering to my stuff. So it's good. Mm -hmm. Good. Get a bit of less responsibility for you, but it's brilliant. So thank you very much to anyone for watching. Thank you, Drac. I will see you all again tomorrow night. This is Paul Woodadge for World War II TV saying have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much.